action. All right, Jordan, you have a question? No? Okay, that's going to be edited out. <laughs> so <laughs> this is my first attempt to do a live recording for uh, some supplemental instruction on demonstrations of how we're going to develop different time histories for modeling purposes. We discussed in the previous lecture the two main methods of time history scaling and spectral matching. So uh, let's go ahead and attack time history scaling first. Now, like I mentioned in previous lectures, time history scaling used to be a bear because everyone had to just rely on their own databases that they'd been collecting over time. So they've been accruing their own time histories and then they had to write their own search algorithms and, and they always had their favorite time histories that they kept going back to time and time and time again. But then enter the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center and the NGA West project. They developed their database, shared it with the world, and then developed all of the search tools that you need to find your time histories. So in other words, they're not only giving you access to their tens of thousands of recorded time histories, but they're giving you the tools you need to find the time histories you want. So pretty powerful, okay? Let's go ahead and do a demonstration. So um, if you were just starting from scratch, you could open up a Google search engine or something, and you could type peer NGA West database or something to that effect. And just do a search. And you see this peer ground motion database, the first thing that pops up. I'm going to click on that, and it's going to take me to this welcome screen here. Now, there's some new things from the last time I've been on this site. The NGA West stuff, that database right here, that's been there for a while. And that's cool. And so you can click on this little database emoji thingy here and go in and, and check out the database. Here's what's new. They've now added the NGA East database. So all the time histories from continental seismic sources. This is cool because this means that if you're dealing with a site that's in a continental region that isn't in a high seismicity region, but you still want to develop time histories, you can grab them from this NGA East database using the same processes and techniques that we're going to show you and demonstrate here. Okay? So if I click on this, it's going to take you to a screen that looks like this, where it's going to say you have to sign in. All they want to do is they want to track who's using their database. There's no obligations. They're not spamming you. At least I don't think they're spamming you. There's no fee or anything, but you have to sign up in order to use this database. So I've signed up a long time ago, so I'm just going to enter my information. When you do sign up, they're going to give you, um, they're going to send you an email to confirm your account just to make sure you're not a robot or something like that. Go to your email, click on that, and then you're in. Once you're in, um, you can go ahead and use the database as we're about to demonstrate here. So the very first step that pops up when you're using this NGA West ground motion database is it's going to ask you for targets. What do, what do we mean by target? Teddy, what is it? Period. Yeah, target period. Tar well, target response spectrum. So remember how we, we, you guys were asking the questions when we were talking about conditional mean spectrum. Why in the world, if I'm only interested in one period, why do I need the full spectrum? This is why. Because now we're talking about having a target spectrum that we're going to match time histories to. So let's go ahead and use that homework example that we had where we developed a conditional mean spectrum for a site in downtown Salt Lake City. And we're going to use that conditional mean spectrum as our target for this. So this is like the next step in that analysis. Let's assume the structural engineer wants time histories to perform some sort of dynamic model for the structure that's being designed at this site. Sound good? Okay, so if I click down here, you're going to see that there's lots of different options. So the first option is no scaling. That's basically saying, I really don't want a target. I don't have a target. I don't really care about a target. Just show me time histories. 
Okay. The next one, Peer NGA West 2 Spectrum. If you click on that, you're going to see that some options pop up. What do these boxes look like? What do these inputs look like? Yeah, the inputs to the NGA West 2 spreadsheet. This is basically the NGA West 2 spreadsheet. It's just saying, I'll calculate a median, or you can even specify, specify like a median plus however many your standard devi deviations response spectrum, and that response spectrum will be my target. So if you want a deterministic response spectrum target, this is what you're going to use. Or you can say, I want a user-defined spectrum. So this would be, I've already calculated my response spectrum. I just want to upload the periods and the corresponding spectral accelerations, and those are my targets. Finally, there's the ASCE code spectrum. This is where, uh, where we talked about using code to develop like that tabletop response spectrum. This, so we can use a tabletop response spectrum if we want for our target. We just have to provide the necessary inputs there. So we're going to use a user-defined spectrum. I'm going to pull up my homework folder here where I have all that stuff from homework six saved. I've actually pulled it out and kind of pre-prepared this demonstration. So if I had the text file, here's what my conditional mean spectrum looks like for the Salt Lake Temple Square site. You have to write it in this format where you have, you can have the name, then you have a space, then you can have your label. So first column is going to be period and second column is going to be spectral acceleration. So for every period of my target response spectrum, I have its corresponding spectral acceleration and I'm just going out to five seconds on my response spectrum. Now that's a text file. This program requires that you save that stuff in a CSV file. So here's my CSV file. It's, all it is is I opened up that text file in Excel and I saved it as a CSV. So here's the format that your target needs to be in. I just saved that file. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to upload that file All right, there it is, example spectra. I'm going to click on the CSV file and I'm going to click open and upload. Okay, what you were looking for is this red, that's red, right? Yeah. Not green? Okay, red text that says file was successfully uploaded. You're not going to see any plots, you're, not going to, you're just going to see that text that says it was uploaded. Then you're going to click the submit button. Then you're going to see processing, and then it's finally going to show you, there it is. There's my target spectrum, and it's in big, bold red. That is red, right? Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's red. So, once I have that, I can click now on my search records. So now the database is going to allow me to search its vast records for time histories, that are going to, it's going to compare against that target response spectrum. And it's going to help me find the best time histories that match that spectrum. Pretty neat. So a couple things we can do. If you push this button that says load sample input values, um, are you sure? Yes. All it's doing is it's just populating stuff so you can see what the format is that you need to enter in those cells. Let's go through and look at these cells. These first boxes that are empty are if you're looking for a specific time history event. You already know the event you want, or you know the record number that you want. You're going to type it in, and it's going to pull up that specific record. I don't know what record I want. I want it to search for me and find it. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm leaving those blank. Come down here now to search parameters. I have fault type. You can see all the different combinations of fault types we can search for in the database. Notice these are all crustal faults. So uh, this is Salt Lake City. So what type of faults do I have? I have normal faults. Do you see any, any options that are just normal? 
Not really. So, because there's not a whole lot of recorded normal faulting events. So I have to pick some combination. So I could do normal oblique if I wanted, but I don't think I'd get very many time history records. What I like to do if I'm looking for normal faults is strike, slip, and normal faults. Because seismologists have shown that strike, slip records aren't that different from normal fault records. Reverse fault and normal fault, those are very different. But strike, slip, and normal fault, pretty similar. So if I click on that, it's going to give me a wide range of ground motions to choose from. Next, I have magnitude. So every one of these cells now, I can enter a minimum and a maximum value. That's going to define the window that the search is going to occur within. So um, for the Salt Lake segment of the Wasatch Fault, we're expecting around a magnitude 7.0. So I'm going to leave this magnitude range right here. I think that's a pretty good magnitude range from six and a half to seven and a half. Now you can adjust that as you want. What happens if you do a search and you only get like four hits back? You got to widen your search parameters. So maybe you'll make larger magnitude range. Maybe you'll make larger distance range, those kinds of things. Okay. So here's my RJB terms. I have minimum and maximum. If I'm sitting on the Salt Lake Fault and the, the Wasatch Fault is, dry, is diving directly beneath my feet, what's my minimum RJB distance I can expect? Zero. Very good. So maybe I'll put zero in there. And then I could have a different maximum. I could go five or ten. Depends on really how narrow I want to be in my search. I'll put ten. And then I'll do the same for my rupture distance, 0 to 10 kilometers. Now, um, did in that homework problem, did I say what the VS30, the shear wave velocity was? was 270. 270? Okay. So if it's 270, um, I want to bound that 270. So maybe I'll do like uh, 2 to 300 meters per second for my... Um, <clears throat> average shear wave velocity in the upper 30 meters. And then uh, I typically don't worry about duration parameters. I mean, you can if you want to, but I'm just going to leave that one blank. You can leave any of these options blank, by the way, and I just won't consider them in the filtering. Okay, next is this pull-down record that says, do you want a pulse? What this is referring to is a directivity pulse, a forward directivity pulse. Do you want records? and only records that have a directivity pulse? Do you want records that have no directivity pulse? Or do you want any record? So, you know, my initial search, I may just look for any record. Then you can specify your maximum number of records you want to look at so you don't flood yourself with uh, huge options. And this is a really critical box, so I hope everyone's paying attention. Initial scale factor. Scale factor is something that I've seen burn so many engineers when they've tried to do this uh, in consulting. Because there's kind of an unwritten law out there that states if you have too high a scale factor, then it's, you're, you're fudging the, the time history too much. So an acceptable range is usually a factor of two. I've seen that fly through review pretty, pretty easily. So if I do like a range of um, plus or minus a factor of two, so that's going to be uh, my, my scaling factor of 0 0.5 to two, minimum and maximum. I've seen them go up to three, a factor of three. So that would be 0 0.33 for my minimum and three for my maximum. But it's always best to start with a factor of two. And if that works, then you're good. Okay, now this is where things start to get a little complicated. So let's make sure that I can hopefully explain this a little better to you. This is how the NGA West database is computing the time history itself. SRSS is the square root of the sum of the squares. So this is going to be like, if I have, um, say, this is my station, and I'm recording 
ground motions in two orthogonal directions. So say I'm recording accelerations in that direction and I'm recording accelerations in that direction. So each one of these is time and that's time. Cody, did you have a question? Yeah, so I guess the only time that I've used squared or something squared is with regression. Is that okay? Pretty much. Yeah, so all we're doing, that's a time. I hope you can tell that. What it is, is that for every time step, so I have, I have record one, and I have record two, and then I have time. So let's, let's just say that this is record one in this direction, and this one is record two in that direction. So for every time step, that I have all the way down to however many seconds there are in the earthquake, we're going to have some sort of, you know, acceleration value. I'm just making these numbers up. I mean, but the point is that, you know, there's going to be some sort of record of an acceleration time history in each of these directions. However that is. The square root sum of the squares basically says that we're going to compute the square root of record 1 squared plus record 2 squared. And then we're going to square root those results to just get one number. So it's almost like an average of er in every time step in the, in the time history. So we're just trying to get like an average time history. Okay? That's going to be square root sum of the squares. Now, the next option that you'll see is what they call rote D100. That means what they're going to do is they're going to rotate that time history, both of those orthogonal time histories, 360 degrees, and they're going to find the one single orientation that gives them the largest ground motion. And that's the one it's going to give you. So you have to rotate your orthogonal time histories using vector rotations and, and get your maximum time history. That's rote D100. Rote D50 is where, again, you're going to rotate your vectors of your time histories, but you're going to just compute the median for all of your rotations. So it's, again, a kind of an average for the, all of the rotations, but it, it's the one that the NGA West models are developed from. So when you use your NGA West 2 spreadsheet, that's what it's giving you, is that rotated mean 50th percentile ground motion. Then there's the geometric mean. And then there's H1 and H2. What do you think those are? Any ideas? Yeah, what do you think? Not quite. It's just picking the actual ground motions. So it's just saying, I don't care what the orientation is. H1 is just our recorded ground motion in the first direction. And H2 is the other ground motion 90 degrees from it recorded. So those are the actual ground motions recorded. And what do you think V is? Vertical. So that's the up-down ground motion. Okay. Here is the most important thing you need to hear. The, I love everything about this database except one thing. That when you go to download your time histories, it does not, when you download the time histories, it just will download these H1 and H2 time histories. It will not scale the time histories for you. It will not rotate them for you. You have to do all that on your own. So I'm not a big fan of that. It'll tell you what your scaling factor needs to be, as you'll soon see, but it won't 
rotate them for you. It only gives you the raw data. So for the homework, I recommend that we just select H1 or H2 so that we don't have to do any rotations because that's above and beyond this class. Okay, Jacob? So why don't they give you that, those adjusted time history? Because they have to calculate those to say that this is, that actually is what it is. Yeah, I don't know the reason why. I think, uh, so, so he's asking, why don't, why don't they give them to you? I think there's a liability thing. Maybe they don't want to have the risk of having an error in their calculations or something like that. They want that to be on you, not on them. But I'm not sure that that's the reason. For whatever reason, though, they just don't do it. Okay. All right. So then I can put in my damping ratio, and I can compute how I want to get my average, arithmetic or geometric. Uh, you know, for this example, we'll just leave it at arithmetic. Um, and, and it's up to you how you choose to do this. You just need to make sure you describe how you do it. Then the last thing, um, we'll leave the scaling to the minimize, the mean square error. We're going to come down to the weighting functions down here. So the weighting functions are basically telling us where on the response spectrum are we really interested in. So you'll recall, or maybe you'll recall, if we go back to our lecture, when we talked about time history scaling, we often say that we're interested in a window that ranges between 0.2 times the natural period to one and a half times the natural period. That range is what we're, we're really interested in. So we're going to put that window in in our search criterion up here. So do you guys remember what the natural period of interest was for the, um, this problem, this homework problem? It was 0.3 seconds, right? 0.3 second. Okay, so 0.2 times 0.3 second is what? 0 0.06. And then 1. Point, was it 1.5? Yeah, 1.5 times 0.3 second is 0.45 seconds. So I'm just telling it the, the window that I'm interested in on the response spectrum for my matching. Anything outside that window, it doesn't really care about. And then these are just weighting functions. You can weight um, the front end higher than the back end or the back end higher than the front end. I just weight it all evenly through that whole window. So I just put weights of one to one. And, and that's probably what you should do anyway. So now let's just search records and see what comes up. So it's doing its thing. And this is the beauty of this database is it's doing all the hard work for you now so that you don't have to find your own time histories. And the process can take a while, but then it's going to tell you, hey, search was successfully created. You're welcome. I had to fit that in somewhere. And there it is. So all of those little gray lines are the, the individual time histories that it found and the response spectra from those. That big, thick black line is the arithmetic mean that it computed from the selected time histories. The dashed black lines are the plus or minus one standard deviation of those. And what's the red line? My target. So I can go down and I can look at the time histories it found. This is an important aspect of this. So if I'm choosing time histories, did you, do you think that it makes sense if I pick all a whole bunch of time histories from the exact same earthquake? Why not? What do you guys think? Yeah, bingo. We just don't have as much variance or variability, and, and that's the whole point of doing multiple time histories. So generally, you want to select time histories from different earthquakes. So you can look right here in this column, it's gonna tell you the event and the year of that event. And check this out, number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, look, they're all coming from the same event, just different recording stations. So if I pick a whole bunch of those time histories, I'm biasing 
my time history development to that one earthquake. And I don't want to do that. So what I may do is I may just pick um, a couple of time histories from some different events. I have to scroll all the way down to number 15, and then you see I get Kobe, Japan, and then I have Dutse, Turkey, at Darfield, New Zealand. So I have one, two, three, four, five time histories selected. This column right here that says um, scale factor, you see that column where I'm at? That is the scaling factor for the time history record. If you scroll over all the way to the right, it's going to tell you which file is H1 and which file is H2. It has the actual name. So which, which did I search up here? I did H1. So th all of these records are just these time histories from, I'm trying to navigate here, I'm struggling, from the H1 column. So I'm not even looking at H2 right now, just H1. So one other thing I'll show you, this column that says T sub P, that's the period of the directivity pulse. So what happens if that's blank? There's no directivity pulse. If there's a value there, that means there is a directivity pulse in that time history. So that's how you can tell whether or not your time history has directivity in it. So I clicked five records. If now you click this little square right here that says rescale using checked records, what it's going to do is it's going to recreate my plots using just those time histories I selected. It's going to take a little second. While it's doing that, are there any questions up to this point? Yeah. Okay, which part of the parameters? It's just up at the top. These? Uh, no, at the very top. The search parameters. Oh, okay. Wants to look at the search parameters? Okay. Got them? Okay. So there it is, with the, the five time histories I selected. What do you notice about the little gray lines? <clears throat> they, they extend out a little bit more, but what can you tell about my mean? Does the mean look like it's a decent fit to my target? Yeah, so I think those are some pretty good time histories. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go ahead and note somewhere, I'm going to note the scale factor for the time histories I selected. Write them down, that's a good idea. And then get also the name of the file from the time histories you selected. We're using H1. So I'm going to get the H1 acceleration files. If you come down here, there's some different download options. If you don't want to write them down, that's OK. You can click Download Search Results. <coughs> and what will happen is it downloads this spreadsheet. And you pull it up. It has all your search parameters in there. And then it has all the time histories you selected. It has the records, has the scaling factor, it has the pulse period, um, and then it has the name of the record right here. So it has all that stuff if you want it. Why do you want that? Well, because when you click on download time series, here's the warning it gives you. What does that warning say? These are unscaled, unprocessed, raw time histories. Okay? Got to be careful with that. Click OK. I acknowledge that. And click OK. And then what it's going to do is the time histories you selected, it's going to put them in a little zip file, and it's going to give them to you. It's just taking a second to do here. Then, what are you going to do with those time histories? If they're raw, unscaled, how can you scale them? Could. What tool have we used already this semester to deal with plotting time histories? Seismo signal. 
So you could open up the time history in SeismoSignal, apply your scaling factor when you import it. You remember that little box that said scale factor? You can enter your scale factor there and it will plot your acceleration values. Then all you need to do is go to the time history tab and, and copy and, and select and copy the acceleration velocity displacement time histories and you got them. So if I open up this file, this is what it looks like. Kind of scary. So you see these RSN6, and there's a whole bunch of them. What do those represent? One of the earthquakes that we identified or selected. So you see this 180, and you see 270. Those are the, the orientations in azimuth of the, of the recording stations. So one of these, the 180 or the 270, one of those is H1 and the other is H2. When you see A2 or AT2, that's acceleration, what do you think DT2 is? Displacement. Displacement. What do you think VT2 is? Velocity. Velocity. See that? And when it says up, do you see how those say up? What do you think that is? That's the vertical time history. That's correct. So here's where you get your raw time histories. So folks, once you have the raw time histories, it's up to you to make sure that you scale them properly and that you import them and plot them correctly. So one thing that, uh, for instance, you might do is I have a spreadsheet here that I made where I have different time histories. Um, you don't need to worry about like fault normal, fault parallel. All you're doing is plotting one of the time history components. So here's time, here's acceleration, velocity, displacement for that one component. And it's going to come over here and I plot acceleration, I plot velocity, and I plot displacement all right on top of one another. If you wanted to plot them orthogonally, you could. But for this homework assignment, I'm only asking you to, to just get one of the components. You don't need the two orthogonal components. And then you could go to the response spectra and plot those as well. So you can have your target on there, and then you can compute your, your mean, and then have your individual time histories as well. So you're going to be doing this kind of stuff on the time history assignment. Now, I didn't have time to get to and record spectral matching and do that demonstration for you. And you're going to want to see it. So what I need to do is I'm going to record that later today and I'll post it as a second video onto YouTube and you can see that demonstration of how to use Seismo Match. How many of you have had a chance already to go and try to download Seismo Match? about a third or a fourth of you, I'd say the rest of you hop on it and try to get it. It's the same developers of Seismo Signal, same deal, but understand that this is a really screaming sweet deal because your students, you get Seismo Match for free, which means you're going to be able to modify and do spectral matching of time histories for free. And uh, that's normally, you know, software to do that and consulting is, is pretty expensive. Of course, you can only use it for learning and things like that. You're not authorized to use it for consulting, but at least you'll get to learn how to use it. Um, I believe Seismo Match is in the same computer labs that Seismo Signal is, as they should be all on the same machines. So if you don't have access to your own personal computer uh, and can't download Seismo Match, that's fine. Just go ahead and, and use them in the computer labs. So I'll do a demonstration with that, and you can go and, and check that out on your own time. That'll help you with the homework assignment due next week on Friday. Are there any questions about what we talked about today with scaling? None? Okay. It's a pretty powerful tool. Have fun playing with it. Um, in this assignment, there's 29 people in this class. I'm going to get 29 different sets of time histories for this assignment. That's the way it always works because everyone finds different sets of time histories. So nobody's assignment is going to look the same. They might look similar, 
but nobody's is going to be the exact same. So that's kind of one of the fun things about dealing with time histories. Okay, well, if there's no questions, we'll go ahead and end this recorded lecture, and uh, I'll get that posted for you guys along with the seismo or the, the spectral matching lecture. Thanks, guys.